I hope you are hearing me well. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Pilin, I'm Program Manager at CONTAC. And today I'm here to introduce CONTAC, let you know about housekeeping rules and facilitate Q&As. Uh, CONTAC is a theater and arts venue based in Manchester. At CONTAC, we aim to put young people at the heart of our decision-making to create an artistic program that is diverse, accessible, and for everyone. Health, science, care, and well-being are, are key strengths of our program. When our building reopens, which will be very soon, it will include a dedicated health and science space funded by Wellcome Trust. Neurodiversity and new models of leadership are important to us and to our young people we work with. So we are really excited to be hosting this event. We would like to remind you that you keep your cameras switched off and microphones muted for the first part of this event. We recommend you to choose the setting, hide non-video participants while watching. During the Q&A section, we will invite you to turn on cameras on. However, please be aware that this event is being recorded and live streamed. And if you switch your camera on, you may appear on video. Turning on your camera is totally optional. You can also participate in the Q&A via chat function or raise your hand. Feel free to make any comments during the lecture. However, we ask you to post, post your questions to the chat when Q&A starts. We want this event to be an inclusive, accepting and welcoming space for everyone. We won't tolerate any form of dis discrimination or hate speech. If you have any issues or need support during the event, you can contact Chloe uh, through Zoom chat, production contact theater, or sending email to her Chloe Courtney at contactmcr.com. This event will be live, live captioned. You can turn the captions on by pressing the CC button below. Welcome everyone. Now, Ale, co-creator of Performing Borders will have a few words. Thank you. Hello. Hello and welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today. Catalyzing change through heartful agitation, be healed disciplined, is part of Performing Borders Live 20, a program that runs until the 25th of October. I am Alessandra Cianetti, co-curator of Performing Borders alongside Xavier de Sosa, who is in the audience today, so hi Shav. Before introducing our amazing artists today, I'd like to thank our events partner uh, for hosting us and for their brilliant work. So thank you, Contact and All Round Theatre Commons. Also, I'd like to thank the Arts Council England for supporting us, and Andrew Howell, our live captioner. So today, I'm really excited to introduce uh, Kai Sing Tang's performative lecture and multidisciplinary work. Kai is an artist, curator, and academic who co-leads the Neurodiversity in and Creative Research Network. She is senior lecturer at the Manchester School of Art and visiting artist at the King's College London. Networks she has founded include also Run Run Run, Running Cultures Research Group, and she's the co-founder of Arts and Mobilities Network. Also, she is the UK Adult ADHD Network's creative and cultural consultant, psych art advisor, and music in detention trustee. Kai argues that artists with non-standard and neurodiverse ways of thinking can help invent new pathways towards solutions to the major challenges facing our societies and work to co-create a better and fairer world. After Kai's lecture, the Q&A with the audience will be facilitated by artist, writer, and curator, and also member of Neurodiversity and in Creative Research Network, Ashokumar Mistry. And now over to Kai, time to learn how to be ill disciplined. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Alessandra. And thank you, Pelin, for the introduction. I hope everyone can hear and see me. So I'm just going to share my screen now. And I hope that works. Great, excellent. So, um, first of all, let us be clear. So this is a talk about leadership and there will be a ship somewhere 
during the PowerPoint. But no, there will be no requests for you to, there'll be no requests for you or for anyone to do any power poses. But if someone could send them a memo to the self-help and leadership development industry, which is worth 336 billion pounds, that power doesn't quite work like this, that would be really good. Sure, there are glass ceilings or glass labyrinths, so you have to man up and take up space. But for too many of us, no amount of power poses will actually get us through another architectural feature, which is um, the door. And even then we will soon hit um, brick walls of racism. So while we're here, so just another quick memo while we're here. So stop saying things like, um, quote, we didn't build those walls or they, they are racist, not us in the arts and culture, we're liberal and so on. We're liberating other marginalized people. Um, so, so, and also stop saying things like, oh, our oppression might be more important than you, than yours. And here's the backlash, go stand against the wall that we didn't build and so on and so forth. And I must apologize for the absence of um, post-it notes for this leadership talk, because usually they are everywhere in these sort of events and it's for brainstorming and co-creation, you know, that sort of thing. But don't get me wrong, I do have a profound fetish for stationery and I use them at this workshop that you can see on the screen. And I don't know if you can see, um, yeah, there's some work, some post-it notes on the walls around me. Still, no amount of post-it um, notes or for that matter marker pens or whiteboards or bullet points or whatever will enable me to finish all the tasks that I need to do or even get them started. So there's so much, so much to do, so little time, but there you go. There will also be no post-it notes today because obviously we are doing this remotely on Zoom because we're in the middle of a pandemic. Um, one final memo. So in spite of us being in the middle of a pandemic, I will not be talking about resilience because I won't be asking us to suck it up and um, enable and normalize or reproduce bad behavior or bad practice. Um, so what will I do? Well, I will. what I will do is to um, raise questions around leadership. So some of us might be cringing right now. Oh, leadership, um, what a toxic neoliberalist, filthy, filthy word. I don't use those words. Some of you might be saying that. But others might be thinking, oh, I am a leader. We're all leaders. So my invitation for us is to unpack the term together today and to think about how leadership relates to other terms like change and power. And could we change and own and reimagine what leadership could be. And what if we throw in a couple of more terms, you know, for example, um, for example, creativity and neurodiversity, two, two more words into the mix. So could we think about a kind of a creative neurodivergent leadership, a model of leadership that is creative and neurodivergent? And what could that look like or mean or do? And I'll give my version a name and I call it artful agitation. And my aim today, however, is not quite to answer that question, but simply to kind of map up the scene and to catalyze some thinking around these terms. So I'll be really keen to hear your version of um, leadership and your version of creative leadership or creative neurodivergent leadership. Um, so good afternoon or good morning, wherever you are. I think it's 7 a.m. in San Francisco or 12 a.m. already the next day in Sydney. Again, so little time, so much to do. So wherever you are, thank you for joining us. And I wish to thank Contact Theatre, Performing Borders and Howl Round for making today's programme possible and also Andrew for captioning this. Um, because this is live streamed, I was thinking it would be quite fun if we show the live, live broadcast on my screen and then to show that to you. And then there would be a kind of a hall of mirrors, but we won't be doing that. Um, but high speed internet isn't a reality for many colleagues worldwide or even in the UK and elsewhere. So we will be publishing this video clip, a recorded version of this on multiple websites so that you can watch it at your own time. And also rather than my usual 300 slides or so, we'll be using only about 282. 
And I also upload the slideshow on my website. So who am I? My name is Kai and um, my, I'm an artist, curator and so on. And Artful Agitation is a new framework that I'm kind of toying around with. Um, it's a kind of a framework around leadership and with a focus on being ill-disciplined. Um, there are quite a lot of words that I'm using and, and abusing, but don't worry, we'll be unpacking those words as we go along. So today, um, for the next, um, hopefully 28 minutes or so, it will be a kind of a montage of a range, a divergent range of concepts and practices, drawing on research findings by myself or readings or lived experiences, observations and so on and so forth. So I will share nine interrelated provocations and um, part two of this will be happening next year. So I'll be developing this idea as we go along. So what, we're sh what we are um, looking at today is the first iteration. But in November um, next month, next couple of months, there will be a, um, something called Being Human, the Being Human Festival that I'm participating. So if you are keen, you're very much welcome to join that. That's free of charge. It's, it's going to be delivered by UCL, University College London. So please come to that as well. So I'll be talking and um, I would very much welcome questions afterwards. I'm really keen to hear your feedback. So before you start, maybe you can introduce yourself, say where you are, who you are and so on. And today, um, oops. Asha Kumar Mystery will be leading the Q&A session. Ashok, of course, is a Leicester-based multidisciplinary artist and writer. So do check out his website and also do have a look at his forthcoming podcast. And he's just written a really nice, meaty, robust provocation. So go and have a look at that. And when people were entering the room, there was music and that was by a colleague called Philip Tan. So please um, have a look at his work on his website as well. Ashok is a member of the Neurodiversity In or End Creative Research Network. And this is a new hub that I co-founded with a London-based social scientist and artist called Dr. Ranjita Dittal. Although I alone take full responsibility for the rather clunky title, I don't know what that business about the forward slashes. Um, so I did it, I can't correct it anymore. And there are quite a few mistakes on this page as well. There you go. Um, so what do we do on this page? Well, there are about 182 of us and we celebrate the messy and magical definitions and entanglements between neurodiversity, creativity and research, unstable and really contested terms as they individually are, but we're also really interested in how they kind of um, interact with one another. So we like to also think of ourselves as critical friends to one another. So people share their ideas, uh, questions that they're working on and so on. And we come from all walks, theater, visual arts, brain and mind sciences, health, dance, from diverse sectors, including museums, higher education, and we're from Taiwan, Canada, Exeter, and so on. Many are neurodiverse, many aren't. There isn't a criteria at all, it's free to join. So please join us. So right, that's all the memos for today and we're going to get going. So first up, what does and what could leadership mean? So the old English origin of the term refers to guidance. And since Plato's proposal of the importance of wisdom in leaders in his book, Republic, 2,500 years ago, as many theories and as many styles of leadership have surfaced. So we have, for instance, um, 19th century models of mythologizing the leader as a hero as championed by the pro-eugenics. And then in the exotic Far East, ideas from thousands of years ago are still alive and kicking in countries like Singapore and Korea, where the government assumes the role of the parent, specifically the father, and the citizens are children. And the idea is that um, the children are obliged to obey what's given to them. So they don't participate quite, they don't participate in the um, process. Then there are feminist models that consider how you are only as empowered as the most vulnerable amongst you. 
And I think that very much is exemplified by the Prime Minister of New Zealand. Uh, so since we're here, maybe we can take a couple of moments to just look at the way people's hands are placed. I know it's not fair. Um, there's a painting, there's a sculpture, and there's a, there's a photograph. And one of them is really stiff. Um, you know, you want to tell him to loosen up, but, um, but let's just look at where the hands are. What does that say? So someone has a hand on heart and other people, and someone else has the hands around another body. And this was after the Christchurch shooting, the massacre. And if we run with the metaphor a little bit more, can we think about hands-on or hands-off leadership styles? What is, which is your style? Which is your approach? And also think about handed down systems, systems that you might inherit when you enter a new workplace. Do you, what do you do? Do you maintain the status quo? Do you blame your predecessors? And also think about the body with the hand with respect to the body, your own body and another body, and the hand as, as an extension of the body to other bodies. So I'm talking about the relational dynamics and also your body and your hand to the place around you, the environment around you. And also the body obviously as this medium, as this interface. And also let's think about how we handle, handle situation, how we handle crisis and emergencies. So check out those hands and check out the pose. What does this say? Well, the COVID-19 tragedy, tragedy, I think, has shown us how normative models of leadership have failed. We are locked in this human-made disaster as we speak, and the most vulnerable amongst us are hardest hit. We turned a blind eye when the virus hit Asia and declaring a pandemic only when white bodies fell. We don't just scapegoat the virus. In fact, we blame algorithms as mutants. They're monstrous, they're in other, they're alien. We demonize migrants as swans and we proclaim that we've had enough of experts. And meanwhile, Black Lives Matter, time's up and we shall not be moved and other movements continue to pose questions for those in power and confirming the need for new prototypes of leadership that prioritize not sideline or do lip service only to equity, diversity and inclusion. Spectacles of protests and mass protests. So I want us to maybe now think about um, spectacle and visuality. How, dis how civil disobedience is performed and the performativity of resistance. Visibility, the importance of showing up and being seen. And also raising visibility, making something visible. Um, and also related to that, the whole idea of seeing, being seen, visualizing visualizing role models, someone who looks like you above you, or if you're a gatekeeper, opening doors to others who don't look like you. Also about vision, think about projecting to the future, since the current, the now is, um, the technical term is that is pretty shit now. So what do you see in the future? What do you want to see in the future? And also your power as an image maker and also as a consumer of image and also as a distributor of image because we are all disseminators of images now. So what are you perpetuating? What kind of discourses are you perpetuating when you press the um, share button on Instagram and so on? So the next point I want us to think about is around neurodiversity. So if leadership is in crisis, could neurodiversity point away? Um, so what is this term? Well, coined by Australian sociologist in 1980, 1998, Judy Singer, the term, ref the term neurodiversity refers to people with autism, ADHD, dyscalculia, and other atypical cognitive modes, which around 15% of the UK population are. So Judy Singer calls for these to be reframed as valuable diversities. And that's quite radical because the norm and was and largely is still about talking about these, um, these conditions as something that is not so good, that is deficit, that is um, in terms of impairment. So for instance, psychiatrists, they like to frame ADHD, autism, and ADHD, autism, and, autism and so on as abnormalities, 
as disorders and they're classified as such. Neuroscientists, however, see differences in brain structure. And then cognitive psychologists, they like to think about the differences in thinking and processing and sensory issues. And then those in, those in disability studies, however, they don't want to put the task, they don't want to focus on the individual. However, they like to look at the environment. And then, well, what's interesting also then is if you move to the movement side of things. So we're talking about the people who are in the kind of cultural um, side of things, the cultural, political, social, social, political, cultural side of things in terms of understanding neurodiversity as a movement. There's a lot of infighting, there's a lot of politics, but maybe you can say largely that they like to see neurodiversity as a normal thing, which is in itself quite paradoxical maybe. I find it very paradoxical and perhaps problematic. So, but interestingly, this sort of more affirmative way of looking at things is, is increasingly fed back to the brain and mind sciences. So that's quite interesting, this kind of movement because people are now studying how traits relate to creativity. So several features of ADHD, for example, like risk taking, divergent thinking and creative giftedness. And also those in dyslexia, like complex problem solving and synthesizing dissimilar con concepts. They happen to overlap with those identified as key for effective leadership. And this is where leadership and neurodiversity kind of collide. And so my question to, to us is, okay, is it neurodiversity or neurodivergence? So there, there isn't an agreed um, 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 consensus, I would say. But if you ask me, I like to go for divergence, because I like how it's associated with divergent thinking. I also like the idea of expansiveness, how things are going wider rather than going in when you talk about divergence. I, I love that kind of um, expansiveness. Because rather like this talk is, it, you can think about montage of different elements and maybe quite disparate, quite different elements. There isn't a need to unify or simplify or reduce anything. So I really like that um, sort of idea because I really like the idea of clashing, collision, juxtaposition. Um, and I like to think of those kind of um, juxtapositions as positively, um, as possibly positive and productive. So I'll go with divergence. And also divergence looks like and sounds like diversion. I don't know if the roots are shared, I didn't check, but as a dyslexic woman, I like that they look similar, they sound which is the title of today's talk, highlighting the pivotal role in, hi, highlighting the pivotal role of being ill-disciplined in artful agitation. And I like to also think about becoming ill-disciplined because it could be an aspiration, maybe. And I like to think about it as using or drawing on abnormality, so-called abnormality, to disrupt norms. And um, the question, so, so if we look, kind of look at ill discipline, I'll break it, break it down a little bit. Um, so I like to think about how we can um, use the idea of ill discipline to question normative approaches and assumptions and interrogate the constructs of normality. So ill is very important. Illness in the first part of this term is important because it, I like to think about how we can subvert, affirm, but also subvert ideas of illness and therefore also interrogate what health means. So they're not necessarily binary. Um, and also when you say ill discipline, we're talking about someone being naughty, mischievous, and that's always described, that's always used when you're talking about people with ADHD, they're so naughty, they're misbehaving. Um, and I like that little hyphen, I think it's a hyphen, not a dash. I know it's a bit straight, but I like the curly one, but um, I don't know what that's called, but I like the hyphen because 
it suggests a kind of a um, it's like a bridge in some way and it suggests a kind of a movement or it suggests that you can step it step on it and I, for me it suggests a kind of a trespassing of boundaries and and I want for me discipline is important because it is about disciplines bodies of knowledges for me I'm in art so other knowledges bodies of knowledge might be I don't know history or science or whatever broadly speaking and I like this idea of trespassing disciplines. So you're not just staying in, oh, I'm an artist, I have to only do this. No, I can go anywhere. So I quite like the hyphen to suggest that. But for me, I, the disciplinarity is also really important because I think in order to do this, you need to actually know your stuff. You need to know what you are coming from, but also equally, if you want to rebel against that, you need to have a reference point to rebel against. And um, it's highly disciplined because the, the, the idea of being ill-disciplined was developed um, a year, two years ago now, um, between myself and professor of psychiatry, Philip Asherson. So I gate crashed his world because I was thinking, oh, I, I don't know why, oh, I want to know. I said, I want to know why my brain is considered as abnormal by people like you. So we talked and we talked through art. So you can see a tapestry behind. Um, there's a lot of um, coverage elsewhere. So if you're interested, go look up. But I would just say that um, this was a conversation which is highly disciplined in that it is a conversation not between a patient and a psychiatrist, but people from two bodies of knowledges who have quite, at that point, um, I would say quite distinct um, perspectives. But we were talking because I, um, that was that's also where the fireworks are, and and I think that's that's absolutely where where the joy is. Um, and Alessandra Cinetti uh, was the producer of this project, and I like to think that the idea of being ill disciplined isn't just coming up from my project because I see people around me that seem to embody that idea, um, and I think they are doing a fairly good job at guiding other people. For instance, Jess Tom, otherwise known as Tourette's hero, who was central in making Battersea Art Centre in London the first, the world's first relaxed venue. There's also Joshua Wong, who, whom friends describe as being full of unlimited energy, and he always makes other people help, hopeful. Joshua is severely dyslexic, trilingual, and a fierce orator. The Hong Kong pro-democracy democracy leader has led hundreds of thousands of protests against the mainland Chinese government since he was 14. And by 18, he was named the world's top 10 greatest leaders and nominated for the Nobel, Nobel Peace Prize by 20. He's been to jail twice and now he's 23 and he's playing a cat and mouse game with the authorities. Whoops. So Jess, Jess and Joshua, for me, um, they both highlight how normal approaches of leadership haven't quite worked and standard approaches have been substandard and failed us. And I think that outlier ways, that unusual approaches have directed us to new possibilities, new orders of things and new imaginations. I think that's really powerful and both have been operating in, and they are operating in, worlds that are built by and custom made for people who are not neurodivergent. But I like to think that it is because of this, it is because of the fact that they, we and they, um, Jess and Joshua and, and those of us who are neurodivergent, because we have been actively excluded from the so-called um, mainstream, uh, the structures of mainstream, that many of us aren't going to be fully subscribed to everything. And also, and therefore we're going to hold everything as suspect. We're gonna be like, hmm, not sure about this, this or that, even though we are fully paid members of humanity. But what is given to us doesn't quite fit us, does it has never been um, kind of accommodated for us. Um, so in fact, a lot of us have been paying much more and being punished for that. And, and, and the most vulnerable are in the front line of the greatest hits. 
especially in this volatile world of ours. And given this volatile world in the face of technological revolution and so on, the global elite at the World Economic Forum and so on, they have been talking a lot about creativity, the importance of human skills with buzzwords like creativity, innovation, agility, disruption. But hang on a minute, I thought disruption was a bad thing, you're naughty. No, but these guys are appropriating these terms now. And it's not just World Economic Forum, these words are everywhere, corporate, cultural, academic sectors, creative, disrupt, um, <laughs> which is interesting. So at, at the same time or around from the 90s, um, you have bestsellers um, that are populate, that, are, um, that were very popular on autism, for example, as a factor for Silicon Valley's success. And another book on ADHD as key for human being survival as a nomadic species. So these, these various um, kind of elements in the landscape has now today made neurodiversity like really sexy, like really marketable. In fact, in fact, um, Neurodiversity has been described as the next talent opportunity. Method, so we're not people, we're methods for fostering innovation. We are competitive advantage and we are a strong business case to bring about better financial outcomes. It's great, I make money, I can make money, that's great. The rhetoric extends to the elites claiming to co-opt weirdos and misfits. So we're terribly trendy now. Oh, we're getting terribly trendy. So in a world that is in flux, so my question to us is, how does your practice, oh, I think I'm supposed to have an image, yeah. So in a world that is in flux, how does your arts practice respond to change and or, or, or mainstream ideas on change? And also how does your arts practice catalyze change. Does it catalyze change? Do you want it to catalyze change? And this photo, of course, is of a boat funded by the artist Banksy and is named after a French anarchist. And what you can see is that it's rescuing and transferring migrants from the sea. And, you, and I would say that someone like Banksy had to step in because those in charge aren't doing the job. And also, I did say in the beginning of this talk that there would be a shit. Okay, it's a boat, but um, what's the difference? Um, and then, um, but then what Banksy is doing isn't new at all. It, there's a deep, profound tradition in the arts where artists use art to agitate norms and to catalyze conversations. Um, Duchamp, he was questioning the norms of the art world. 1920s, we had edged films. We had, people, we had the avant-garde writing manifestos about society, about art. In my work, I like to think, I like to mobilize the body, specifically the restless body as a site of protest, S-I-G-H-T, and also site as a, as a S-I-T-E, site of protest. So in this picture, you can see kids. They are aged seven to 14, and they are running a masterclass for adults, top age, 85. So in this project, I was trying to kind of play, shift things around or upside down a little bit. So I like to also think that each kid was giving two fingers up to Confucius, Confucius's definition of leadership because um, Confucius was the guy who loves paternalism, who was promoting ideas about you know, leadership, being around, uh, being a parent, governing others in an authoritarian way. So I like to think that each of this kid was actually putting up two fingers to Confucius and also 10 toes each. So we had 14 kids, that's 140 toes. So 140 toes up to Confucius. So some of this body of work of mine draws on performance art, life art, and also the art intervention, social practice and so on. 
Um, and also you have um, other artists who are looking at the notions of useful art, for example, which are also closely related to some of these that I've pointed out, um, like Tanya Bruguera. And the idea is that art can change the way we act and can transform people's lives. And essentially art as activism, activism as art. And of course, in um, from the um, Extinction Rebellion and so on, you can see the kind of leakage um, in, um, in terms of the ideas and, and also how the streets are your stage um, where these ideas are performed. And clearly, I think the point is that clearly artists have always been creative and innovative and disruptive. Um, and I also like to point out something about um, how, yes, we often have clear artistic outcomes, but also the processes are artistic outcomes themselves. So the art, um, or another way to look at it is that the art is slipping in in a, in a, in a very um, surreptitious way. So you don't have an output at the end, you have a painting or, or even document photographs or whatever. Um, but the whole process that you design, that you choreograph, that you curate, that is your artistic work. Because you're asking new questions and you're, re -enact you're enacting a different system of doing things. And you are doing, you're inverting things and you're imagining a different order of things. So for me, these are clear, distinct examples of leadership in thought and in action. And they are novel frameworks of organizing, being and creating that critique norms of power. And I think this is bloody artful. Um, and I think we need to be artful because the coronavirus um, isn't just described as novel, but is said to be really clever, it's really smart. Because it's like a ninja. It hijacks your body to jump, literally to transport itself to other bodies. You don't even know. He's like, oh, I need to go for a test because I don't even know if I have it. So it's really, really sneaky. It's clever. So what do we need to do? We also need to be clever. So more than ever, I think we need to be crafty and artful like the virus. But don't worry, the virus won't be the last virus. <laughs> There'll be other there'll be other novel and crafty and artful challenges to come. So could we, could we look into neurodivergent creative practitioners and researchers for insights? And that's 30% of us in the arts and culture sector. And um, the kind of archetypal creative practitioner who is neurodivergent would be someone like Leonardo, Leonardo da Vinci. He had ADHD and dyslexia, which meant, that, which meant that he was quite an insatiable and fearless explorer. I mean, boundaries, I, he didn't quite care. So he did a famous painting of a smiley woman. We know that. He also did a whole bunch of other stuff. Um, he invented the revolving bridge. He did diving equipment. He did some parachutes. It made me wonder, where is he trying to escape to? Because <laughs> there are all modes of transportation. But I think it also points very much to the fact that he was very, very ill-disciplined. He didn't stick to his turf. Um, he was trespassing. Or oh, another way to see it is that his art was spreading. Like he was having his tentacles everywhere. Yeah, that's also art. Yeah, that's also science, whatever. Contemporary examples abound, and which is why, which is where we can turn to the neurodiversity in and forward slash and creative research network. And um, for example, a colleague, Abby Watson, she's based in Glasgow. She uses her dyspraxia to disorder dance practice. Two weeks ago, we held the world's, the universe's first ever disco, D Y S C O obviously. Another member is Judy Singer. So I had a Zoom conversation with Judy two weeks ago, and she tells me about the, how she was inventing that term neurodiversity. I mean, that in itself is having invented a term to have sparked an entire cultural movement and more. 
is already pretty artful. But she was also talking about how she sees neurodiversity as part of, as aligned with the notion of biodiversity. And I thought that's a really clever move. It's clever because you are then looking at things in a quite holistic way. You're looking at um, the interrelations, again, so this relational dynamics of bodies to other bodies, including non-human bodies, and also including to nature. And just as every organism has its place in a, vi a biodiverse environment or ecosystem, every person has their meaningful place in the neurodiverse world. So shall we think a little bit about systems and ecosystems and also the health of such systems? And with that, I want us to maybe think about the behaviors and cultures within these systems. And which is why I wanted to call upon through, the word through, the preposition through. <laughs> and I think it's quite an underrated word. I mean, I, I'm very bad with prepositions, but I was looking it up. So prepositions are words that govern a noun. And when you put it like that, it sounds really important because it is governing what comes afterwards. Um, so I was talking about catalyzing change through artful agitation. So actually the through is pretty important if you look at it that way. So I thought, oh, maybe we should spend a little bit of time talking about the through. How are you doing that? Um, so think about your, how you do things or your organizations. Um, the culture that you are building, does it have zero tolerance for racism, for example? Does it, um, does it use power to reinvent the wheel or does it just kind of um, use the existing system or does it reinvent the wheel? For instance, like Jacinda Ardern of New Zealand. So she is a prime minister of New Zealand, but she didn't just go with the flow. She has now, in fact, said that well-being, not profit, is the measure of GDP in New Zealand. And also, if you think about culture, um, maybe we can think about um, um, culture. Cultures that you create, do they give permission for, or do they normalize? Quite problematic, but let's go with that. Do they problematize, or do they normalize play? Do they normalize things like failure? So the, the picture you can see on the left is um, of the South London Gallery. And um, this was a speed date, a speed dating event I did at the South London Gallery. And people were having fun and speed dates are the best because you, there's, no, there's no need for commitment. You just have some fun and then you move on. <laughs> That's nice, I like that. So a lot of my work are really short and sweet. Don't know about sweet, but short. And then the next, the picture at the other side, um, maybe we can think about failure. Uh, so this is a family, they are outside the corridor of the one bedroom flat. And this is obviously from um, the last century, a photograph from the last century. At least two of the kids here have formal diagnosis of um, neurodiversity, um, neurodiverse conditions. But the adults, um, so one of them you can see here, he left school by the age of 16 with few qualifications and he had to do three jobs to, uh, to feed the family. The famous example was that he walked out of a math exam because he couldn't answer one single thing. And where's my mom, you ask? She might be taking a photo. But I think, and then when you study the photo, you think, actually, um, I mean, look at me. I look really bewildered. I suspect my father was actually taking a selfie. Look at his extended arm. But it's the wrong century, so I'm, I'm not actually sure. Is this failure? then ask ourselves, what is our criteria for failure? What is our criteria for success? Leonardo da Vinci, um, actually none of what he invented was realized. Was he a failure? Joshua Wong, he is on the run <laughs> and it looks like he's on a losing battle. Is he a failure? Um, or maybe could we think about success in other ways? Maybe Leonardo da Vinci teaches us um, how we can take on, use our imagination to take us somewhere else, to give us the permission to think of something else. So think about the culture that you are within or that you want to create. 
what is your mission statement? So I'm showing um, mission statements and value statements by um, two of our collaborators today. And what is, what's yours and what's your manifesto? Does it allow or nurture productive antagonisms and divergences or no, everyone has to say this, sing the same, sing from the same song sheet as they say. What about the architecture, architectural features? Do you, do you have doors that open up to others? Or do you have windows of opportunities for others? Is there fresh air? <laughs> are they, or are, are you creating labyrinths and walls without realizing that? Um, and also, I want to just point out very quickly, um, I think often we forget the need to, to disrupt the notion of neurodiversity. So if you are creating these systems, think about how, um, how you need to diverse, diversify neurodiversity because sometimes we have blind spots and we think we're doing enough already. We're white feminists, we're in disability. Yeah, we're, we're already covering, well, we have already covered minority interests, we're done. No, you're not done. So think about, um, think about what you might be setting up subconsciously and also within this, think about care, self and others. So maybe if we have time, we can talk about this um, because often people who are neurodivergent have behaviors that are not usual. People tell me I'm really intense and I'm like, what do you mean by intense? I'm not intense. And then they walk, and then they escape. So maybe we can talk about that. Um, so, so we live in times of crisis in health, mental health, climate change, um, democracy, human rights, you name it. So we need to top up our, top our game. And as we contemplate the great reset, building back thinking and making inform and challenge dominant modes of leadership and the new normal. So I want us to think about um, other approaches, abnormal approaches. So today what I've done is to lay out the foundation for what I think would be working towards a kind of a creative neurodivergent model of leadership and we, with creativity firmly anchored in the arts and with a distinct, so I want to try to weave a distinct case for creativity, creativity because often it's very woolly, it's not quite defined. But rather than fats or financial baits, I like to think of us, I like to, for me, neurodivergence is the governing adjective and the noun and the action verb. So art for agitation isn't about neurodivergent artists being fit for purpose or being fixed at one place or being fixed, i.e. treated or begging for reasonable adjustments. Instead, it is a paradigm shift. And that's why I want to take on leadership, toxic or whatever the term might be, because I want to suggest, no, let's try to reclaim that. Let's invert things and put neurodiversity before leadership. And I just think that it addresses some gaps in knowledges out there. And I think it is so important to have vision. It's, it's a conceptual model, but I like to, I like to see how, I, like us, I, like, I hope that it can also inspire us towards other models. And in the long run, I'm calling up for a more inclusive socio, cultural, political system. And I would argue that it's precisely when resources are tight that we need art. We need art to take us somewhere. And this can be a win-win given how um, terrible things are in the cultural industry, to um, put it lightly. So clearly, um, I also don't want to talk about art for agitation as a purely instrument, as a, as a model that instrumentalizes art only, because I think it is by making it a conceptual model, I am trying to mark out a territory to say that it is to protect the ability for us to dream and also to deal with the abstracts. And, um, and to also celebrate how non-standard, artful, agile, atypical approaches can disrupt neuronormative assumptions. I think I'll end here um, and um, catch the sequel next year. So thank you very much. Let me just escape my stop share. Thank you. And shall we have Ashok come on? Thank you. To um, how much time have we got? Six minutes. Hello. Is Ashok around? Hi, can I see you? Yeah. So Ashok, you're, um, um, it's all yours. 
Oh, thank you. Thank you very much, Kai. Um, I'd like to thank you, Kai, for this mind blowing mind map performance lecture. It's been fantastic listen, listening to it. Um, I'd like people to uh, please share your questions, either by raising your hand or by um, posting your questions in the chat. But um, while the lecture percolates into questions, um, I'd like to talk to Kai very briefly. So being ill-disciplined, this play on words um, has so many layers um, in terms of your work and in terms of this lecture as well. Um, the words energize and activate change. Your words feel to me like drawings. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your, um, what you mean about your relationship with words? Ah, uh, what a simple question. <laughs> My relationship with words is very, very um, entangled and compli it's complicated. <laughs> um, I love words. So all my life, I didn't know I was dyslexic. I've used words all my life um, in filmmaking, in a lyrical way, just running with it. And then I was told quite late that, um, oh, it's actually a different way of using words. Um, so that's quite interesting. But I've always been using word, engaging in word play um, because I like, that's part of my process of unpacking words. And English is my first language because um, I, we were colonized and civilized um, by the Great Britain. and. So, but I love just kind of, because, yeah, so like you, I'm dyslexic and I know how you love just playing with words. There's great joy, kind of pure joy in that as well. It's also about subversion, determining what the situation is, um, say, about kind of overturning things. So it is what people understand and you play around with it. Mm. Mm. The, the, the words really feel like drawings though. Um, hmm and it feels like you're kind of weaving words together so it's not just a very dry kind of you know forming sentences but you're kind of taking people to places to new dimensions almost through your work but um in uh, in the arts we have a lot of re rhetoric around risk and risk taking but at times it feels as though um that thought of risk uh is being smothered by a need for some sort of kind of um pseudo professionalism um even the memories of people uh, in history who have been ill-disciplined as, as you'd call them um how, what would you say about um how they have been um you know that their, their ill-disciplined nature has been kind of almost sanitized when we look at i mean a great example you give is leonardo da vinci and his you know thoughts were going off in all sorts of directions and yet it's framed in such a kind of in such a kind of rectangular almost way but then um you know maybe it's to make it more palatable how can we better understand the value of being ill-disciplined yeah and you expect me to answer it in what one minute <laughs> um it's a great question um i don't know how to answer it but um which is why i was calling upon so that's the sort of material I'm kind of dealing with now, what, how the mainstream, dominant, powerful leadership industry and the guys who have money, basically, how they think about risk. Oh, it's good to, it's good to, it's good to be risky. Nonsense, <laughs> nonsense, nonsense. Mm -hmm. Especially now, institutions have more excuses to say, no, you're not allowed to take risks. Not recognizable, pfft, not allowed. But the, the rhetoric is just at the opposite end. And there is that, oh yeah, oh, we celebrate disruptive. Oh, no nonsense. It, it's, so it's interesting. So we that's my question. answer, yeah. Fantastic. We have a question here. How can uh, the ill-disciplined attitude be used for co-leadership as a new model for divergence and artful agitation? Hmm, hmm. that's a good question. Um, hmm. I think it lends itself to co-leadership because it was a co-created model to begin with. I made, um, so the the notion of Ill, 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 Ill leadership, yeah, why not actually ill leadership, <laughs> ill-disciplined came out from the creative process, two-year process conversation that I had with Philip Escherson, the psychiatrist I worked, the professor of psychiatry that I worked with. 
I think it already lends itself to that. And it is also, it's already saying, yeah, you need to kind of have this element of play and vulnerability um, because it takes two to tango and more, not just, not just one person. So it is already saying, no, you need to kind of like, you know, like take risk a little bit. So look at the children um, running around and with the adults. So the adults have to say, yeah, okay, I'm up for it, right? So there is that self-selection process in a way. So like, yeah, okay, I'm up for it. Um, so, so there is already that kind of, um, I would say propensity, maybe that's the right word for, for co-creation. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's kind of, um, what would you call it, a distributed model rather than a... Yeah, I like to think that. I don't, yeah. Um, yeah, it can't be like, yeah, it's mine. Um, because that wasn't how it was founded in the first place. I wouldn't have come up with that on my own. Um, it was a lot about taking on Philip's ideas, Philip ideas from his world, psychiatry, illness, you know. So I, I think that's really critical. So so I guess the the so it's pre pre so maybe another way to say it is that if you want to take on those ideas, it is already inviting you to. Um, allow co-creation yeah how we've are we got, for time are we do we have to go or we've got an, a, around nine minutes okay yeah so um we'll, we'll kind of we'll plow on if i'll let you yeah um so we've got a comment stroke question um so so much to delve into what would your top three desired actions for us who are listening be for us who are listening top three desired actions it's, it's, it's like it's like the audience and you are conspiring against me it's like yeah top three kai top one <laughs> you give me all the really loaded questions and you're like yeah kai come on on the spot no we're i can't energized. answer that. we're energized we're all here we're we're kind of oh weird. well okay because i've taught for many years and Please. the trick the trick is to say why don't well, what do you think <laughs> what do i think oh, <laughs> yeah part this is about co-creation. Hand, hand the question to other people. Okay. <laughs> You're putting me no, but back. it's a great it's a great question. What's your top three takeaway? I mean, I outline ideas, and I think within those, even though I said, yeah, well, I think within within those nine points, there were quite a few things I said, um, if if in a roundabout way. I think race um, anti-racism is quite key in this. Um, a lot of us kind of slide it like, well, it's done. It's not done. It's not done. It's not done. It's not done <laughs> for the record. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot more to do. And it's not about, it's not an oppression Olympics. It's not about um, a hierarchy of oppression. We need to do it together. So that's, that's one. Um, yeah, that's enough. I think that's, that's a lot. <laughs> Any more questions coming through? um anything i i'd like to kind of go back to this idea of kind of um maybe say a little bit more about this idea of um site of protest so site is in kind of that really kind of mm. hooked me in you know you you re real reeled me in at that point yes so yeah yeah um so yeah I, of course that's wordplay <laughs> And uh, I was like, yeah, great idea. <laughs> um, but it's very much anchored in the fact that, you know, the whole life art, performance art tradition, the body is your material, mm -hmm. your tool, mm -hmm. um, the primary tool. And of course, also the feminist idea, the, the personal is political, et cetera. So this is your, this is your weapon, et cetera. Um, and this is also, and I, my intellectual home might be visual arts. So it's mm -hmm. about the visuality. Yeah. So the sightedness, how you see things when you move, for instance, how you see things when your body is moving through a space with speed or no speed or whatever. And what, how you are seen also. So it's both ways. So when I move, so when I move, um, Quick, so just very quickly. So when I move through, so the sit, when I move, when I run in the city, suddenly I, I'm not just a foreign body or a female foreign body. People start asking me for directions. I'm like, yeah, I'm dyspraxic too. I don't know directions, but suddenly I'm seen to have some ownership because I'm running. 
my body, I take up more space. So, so, so I love that whole kind of, um, kind of nuance around the whole thing about how you're seen, how, and how you see also, because you are moving at speed, you see the world differently. Yeah, I, I mean, I was transfixed at that point, because to me, it was talking about all sorts of things in terms of um, this idea of when you're protesting, you want to be seen. And yet today, mm. when people protest, it's usually online and they're not seen. <laughs> and it's that idea of courage when you're protesting as well. The, the courage, as uh, as in some of the people that you were talking about, you know, during the Hong Kong protests, it was so dangerous for them to actually be seen. You know, it Completely. could have been so much easier and safer to be behind a, um, a screen. Mm. But, you know... No, that's a great point. And I have done a, recently, I, do, I did a talk on performative allyship, <laughs> which is a whole crit critique of the whole, it's so easy, Black Lives Matter, yeah. click. Um, other people have talked in much more eloquent ways around that, obviously. And But this thing about optics, this thing about seeing, being seen um, is very, very interesting. Also with such a visual culture today, um, we use emojis. So we're very, very visual, visually literate. Um, so so that, that's really powerful. So we also we have platforms like Instagram and so on. So, so that's, that's really, really powerful. Um, so this idea of seeing, being seen, and also the tools, the visual tools are much easier now in that you don't need to go to an art school. Nobody needs to go, no, come to my art school. <laughs> Uh, but you don't need to go to an art school to learn how to do this and that. You don't need to go to a film school to pick up a film camera. Um, because these you are your own distributor, your own maker. You are your own, um, yeah, every, every you own, you can own every single part of that process. We have uh, one final quick question. Yeah. Um, yeah. Da, 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 uh, I found... I find your point about hands being such a great way of visualizing different models and ideas around leadership and the body. Do you have a hand metaphor for neurodivergence? <laughs> Hope that makes sense. <laughs> Can you help me? There's me to feel this message and reading the bit in brackets as well. <laughs> yeah, I know. Hen. It makes perfect sense. Yeah, I think I have a few. Um, did I say them? No, was obviously I didn't say enough. Hen, no, I love, no, this is a great one. I love to work on it. Ashok, do you have any suggestion, a hand metaphor? No, um, I, I mean, yeah, a lot of the hand gestures I'm thinking about, they're not really broadcastable, but um, ah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. Uh, I'd probably have to work that one out with the kids. Yeah, like, no, let's, let's, what, more I, li of, I love that, yeah. It, they're a lot more kind of um, eloquent when it comes to kind of playing with hands and playing with this idea of of, of sign and, and, and movement and stuff. So yeah, I'll get back to you on that. Um, no, but... I, there's a great question. I'll I'll cut and paste everything here because I there's a lot. So I'm re I'm really grateful to be given the opportunity to share and try out some of these ideas today. It's the first time I um, I was going to say releasing. <laughs> um, what's the word? So they are ideas I'm toying with. So today's the first time. So I wasn't sure if it was going to be too much or too, I never know tonality. So it's really good to get some feedback and there's a lot to kind of play with and unpack. So thank you for that, um, that opportunity. So thank you very much, Kai, for your insightful words and thoughts on artful, artful agitation. And I'd like to thank Performing Borders and Contact Theatre also for hosting this event. But a big thank you to everyone watching and joining us today. Thank you very much. No, thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. All right. <laughs> mm, someone from Melbourne, Australia. Oh, that's nice.
Oh, it must be like early morning. Hmm. I wonder what time Melbourne is now. Let's have a look. Oh, 12.40 in the morning. It's not too bad. 